Today we're going to revisit De Moivre's theorem. It's one of the most useful and interesting and elegant parts of complex numbers and we looked at it sort of earlier on when we were really exploring the different advantages of polar and exponential forms for a complex number. But as we're going to have a look at today I want to show you that you have to be quite cautious and careful with De Moivre's theorem. I want to explain the reasons why and then I'm going to show you how that sort of provides the reason why there's this sort of classic proof of De Moivre's theorem we haven't looked at within the course yet and I'm going to uh, show you how it all works today. So this is a story in three acts and we're going to begin with why we need to be cautious. So De Marvis' theorem, just to ring the bell for you, is this property that allows us to think about raising complex numbers to a power. And the way that we sort of did a very quick demonstration of it uh, within the course earlier was to think about if you're raising things to powers, the most sort of obvious place or direction to go in is to think about the uh, exponential form of a complex number because the exponential form is written with powers, right? That's how we get the, the uh, argument in there into the index. So if you think about um, some complex number that is on the unit circle. So I've got an R, a modulus of one, the sort of uh, stock standard way of stating De Marvre's theorem uh, thinks about only um, complex numbers on the unit circle and then you could extend it for other complex numbers. What we do is we say, well, what happens when you raise this to the power of n? Uh, what insights can we gain? Well, we can say, well, look, I'm just going to take this um, e to the i theta and I'm just going to write that e to the i theta. So it's can be anywhere on the unit circle, theta can take on any value, and I'm just going to write to the power of n up the top there. But you can see that I can immediately write this in terms of, uh, you know, with my index laws, I can say when you raise something that has a, a, an index to it, if you raise that to um, another index, you raise a power of a power, what you get is the multiplication of your indices, right? So I could write this as e to the power of i, and then I'm going to group together the n and the theta. Um, of course you can multiply i, n and theta in any order that you like. Multiplication is commutative. But the reason why this particular form is helpful is because now I can take the left hand side and the right hand side of the same thing um, written in exponential form and then I can rephrase it in polar form and out will pop De Marvre's theorem. Watch me do it. Um, you've got e to the i theta here and so by definition that is just cos theta plus i sine theta and that's apparently raised to the power of n. When you have a look at this uh, right hand version here it's e to the i and then this n theta that's the argument and so you have a different way of writing the same complex number namely cos of n theta there's the argument and then i sine n theta appears again. And this is De Marvre's theorem, right? It's a really delightful, um, elegant result that we've used a bunch of times to prove things like some of the, the gnarly multiple angle trigonometric identities that you can prove with advanced and extension one techniques, but they're just a pain. Like you have to weave your way through these very long and circuitous um, uh, trigonometric identity proofs. Whereas here, we can just use what we know from you know comparing real and imaginary parts. We can have a look at um, binomial expansions and, and using the binomial coefficients, which are so much more um, efficient than doing it the long way with just with trigonometric identities. So this is great. Um, and it's also very elegant. Like it took all of like, I mean, you could call it one, two, two and a half lines to prove this. There's just one snag. Um, the, having a look at this sort of demonstration of De Marvre's theorem, it sort of gives the impression, when I sort of did this line here, I did a bit of a sort of secret ninja move. I just said, let's raise this to the power of n. And in the real number system, that, that gives you no problems. Raising things to the power of n, do it on the left hand side, do it on the right hand side, no, no big dramas, right? You always have equality. But indices in the complex world run a little bit differently um, and that has to do with the fact that arguments um, can often take on several values for the same complex number and that leads to problems if we take on particular values um, for the n, the power that we raise this complex number to. So to illustrate this, to illustrate the, this caution that's kind of not immediately obvious at all when you look at this proof of De Marvre's theorem, uh, I'm going to take some very particular values for n and for theta that are going to demonstrate why there's an issue here and why we need to be cautious. 
So let's take n equals a half. What if I were to um, take this line here, De Marvis theorem, put n equals a half here, and also put it in over here as well. Now to evaluate things, I do need an angle as well. I need an appropriate theta. So I'm going to choose a couple of different angles and see what happens. Um, here's what I'm, let me zoom out a little bit. Here's what I'm going to uh, give a whirl. I want to try for n equals a half for this particular power. I want to try it for um, cos zero plus i sine zero because that's um, a particular complex number. Uh, it's going to give me a number on the argon diagram. And then I'm going to try and substitute in 2 pi. Now you might think that's a bit weird because you've already done 2 pi. 2 pi and zero are the same. That's kind of the point. We should get the same thing out of everything here if we just take um, you know, zero on the uh, positive side of the real axis and rotate anti-clockwise around 2 pi radians, they should give me the same result. But as you're going to see, um, De Marvis theorem, as stated, runs into a bit of a snag. Let's have a go. I already did the uh, left-hand side kind of verbally just now for theta equals zero and for n equals a half. We're going to get um, cos of zero plus i sine of zero, and I'm just raising that to the power of a half. Okay, nothing too dramatic here. Um, inside the brackets there, cos zero is one, uh, sine zero is zero, so what am I getting? That's just one plus, well, no lots of i, that's raised to the power of a half, so that is just one to the power of a half. No big deal. Okay, now I know you might be tempted to evaluate that, but what I can do is I can go over to the right hand side and I can see what happens over there and that will actually do the evaluating for me. So I don't need to do any guesswork about what one to the power of a half is equal to. Watch and you'll see what I mean. Let's now do the right hand side, which, which is here, cos n theta plus i sine n theta. I'm going to put in um, n equals a half and theta equals zero. Let's give it a go. I get cos of a half times zero plus I sine of a half times zero again. That's clearly just cos zero plus I sine zero. And uh, this looks familiar, right? Because I, I did this over here. So I already know that this is one plus zero I. This should just give me one. And at this point, you are not dramatically surprised because you're like, yeah, I, th I thought one to the power of a half would be equal to one because this power of a half is, is kind of like the square root, right? And we know the square root of one is one. But now watch what happens when we try a different value of theta. I'm going to take the same n, n equals a half, and then I'm going to give it a well for theta equals 2 pi. Let's see what happens. On the left-hand side here, I should just uh, keep, I'll keep that uh, pink line in view there so that I can actually uh, quote straight into it. I'm going to get cos of 2 pi plus i sine of 2 pi, and that's going to be raised to a half, still same value of n. Uh, this is looking familiar, right? You know, cos of 2 pi is still 1, and uh, i sine 2 pi is still 0 i, and that's raised to the power of a half. So you're like, what's the big deal, right? Everything all looks 100% um, fine. 1 to the power of a half, 1 to the power of a half, that's equal to 1. But now, here comes the kicker. And maybe your wheels have been turning as I've been doing this working, and you're realizing what problem's about to emerge. What, ha what happens when I actually start to substitute in um, n equals a half, theta equals 2 pi into the right hand side. Let's just do the substitution. I'm going to get a half times 2 pi plus i sine a half times 2 pi. This is going to give me what well, a half of 2 pi is pi. That's cos of pi there. And then I'm going to have um, i sine of pi. Now, uh, think about the sine function, it sort of starts at the uh, origin, it goes up, comes back to the middle, um, to the axis, uh, at pi. So therefore, uh, this part over here, this part here, is going to give me uh, zero i, just like before. But not this. Think about what cos pi is doing. If you were to uh, picture what the cos graph is doing, that is terribly messy, but it's close enough to say that at pi, cos of pi is going to give me negative 1. Negative 1 plus 0 i equals negative 1. What just happened? Um, we have 1 to the power of a half, that's apparently equal to 1, and then we've got 1 to the power of a half, now equaling negative 1? 
What's the issue here? Well, we have two distinct values for one to the power of a half. We've got plus or minus one. And what we're colliding with is the fact that in the real number system, we only take the principal nth roots of a number. We just say it's just one. Just take the positive value over here. Um, or, you know, for example, if I, I said to you, uh, negative one to the power of a third, that's the, the cube root of negative one, we would just say, oh, it's just negative one. Right, like that's the thing. You multiply negative one times itself, sort of negative one times negative one times negative one, that will give you negative one. So that's the only uh, of the roots that we consider, the principal root, not the positive one. It's just the one that makes the most sense within a real number system. But we can see here that in the complex number system, like that's what's going on here, we're using these complex number tools, the polar form um, of a complex number, De Moivre's theorem, which, which should work, right? Like our proof here um, seems to be watertight, but we are landing on this contradictory issue here. And that's because in the land of complex numbers, the idea of a principal nth root makes much less sense. Like which of the roots is the principal one? Which is the one that is the most valid, the most important? They're kind of all equally valid. They're kind of all equally important. And so the way, like the technical way we would say this, is that if you have a, um, a non, whoopsie daisy, didn't rub that out. Um, if we have a non-integer power that we're raising our, our, our numbers to, when you have a non-integer power here, you actually truly get different potential values at the end. So the technical way of saying this is that z to the power of n, where z is like a complex, we're considering it as a complex number, even if it's a number like one, which is a real number, um, every real number is within the sub, is a subset of the complex numbers, it's just that the imaginary part is zero. Um, z to the n is multi-valued, right? You've got one and negative one, um, or, you know, um, when we think about uh, one to the power of a half, you get the cube roots of unity. So there are multiple values because in that case, n a third, it's not an integer. And that's what this, um, fancy notation here means, and is not an element of the set of uh, whole numbers, the set of integers. So this is weird, right? Uh, and this causes a problem for De Moivre's theorem. De Moivre's theorem breaks down when you put in even something as simple as n equals a half, which is why all the exercises you've ever um, dealt with in w that use De Moivre's theorem, they always hand you integer values because that's kind of where you have to stay. Now, I said we were going to look and see why we need to be cautious with De Marvre's theorem. And here is the sort of essential reason that um, if you pick non-integer values of n, you get this sort of multi-valued thing happening here. You're like, is it one or is it negative one? De Marvre's theorem doesn't distinguish between them. 